Hey folks, welcome back. So some of you might remember that one of my previous videos was about a Traveler Mongoose 2nd Edition Mega Bundle that I got during the Black Friday deals around Christmas time. That was for the Deep Knight Revelation campaign, so you could have inferred from that correctly that I'm a big fan of Traveler, and I indeed am a big fan of Traveler. So March this year has been quite a banner month for releases for Traveler. We've had four pretty well anticipated new items coming out here. So we've got the referees screen update 2024 which you can see right here we've got the travel companion update 2024 which includes rules for vector based space combat for those of you fans of newtonian physics out there we have the adventure class ships book which is packed to the brim with excellent and cool spaceships that your travelers can fly in and finally the small craft catalog which is a catalog of craft under 100 tons that you'll often see plying the spaceways within a system they don't have enough size and, and juice for jump drives but you'll find them all over the place adding flavor and dimensionality to any systems you create for your travelers to run around in so really great resource for gms and also useful for players a lot of good stuff here to cover what i'm going to do is a quick kind of flip through of each of these things i'm not going to go into a lot of detail but just to show you if you decide to dive in on this month's releases first of all i strongly recommend that you do secondly i want to give a shout out to mongoose customer service because i made my order there was a bit of a mix up with the books that i got and i emailed customer service they responded in about half an hour's time they'd already sorted out and already shipped out the correct items with a uh, tracking code and everything. So I must give them applause for that. Puts them right up there with Chaosium in my book for some of the best customer service in the biz. Um, the other thing is if you buy directly from Mongoose, you get the PDFs for free. Applause to Mongoose for that policy and for helping me out so easily and so quickly with this order. So with that out of the way, let's dive in. So their free screen comes wrapped. I've already unwrapped it, as you can see. I'm not putting any lighting on for the moment because the outsides of these are very shiny. <laughs> so we'll just have to deal with the natural lighting for the moment. It comes with this sheet inside the shrink wrap pack, uh, which just gives you a brief preview of the artwork, just so you know what you're buying and how much it costs, but it's not really worth anything. So I'm chuck that away. <laughs> and uh, let's take a look at the artwork on the outside. And you can see it's really fantastic and dynamic artwork. I really prefer this. So the previous GM screen, the arc was pretty pretty cool in that it was kind of the inside of a starship, sort of the starship pilot's view kind of thing. So it gave you the sense of, you know, the, the players were looking at your screen and seeing the inside of, of what they were flying. But that novelty wears thin after a while, whereas this artwork is filled with dynamism and tastes of what you can get in Traveler. We've got people in fantastic vac suits, looks like a Jodani here. We've got various ships careening through the sky, super battleship there from the Imperium. We've got characters of different species. We've got a robot dog. We've got all kinds of stuff going on. There's a, a lovely close-up here of a human of some variety and a Varger as well. They're the dog people of the setting, the uplifted dogs. And yeah, it's a wonderful piece of art. I think this is just really rich. I love the, the style. I love the content. It, it just screams traveler to me. And there's so many recognizable, iconic bits of imagery here. So well done on that, Mongoose. And now we'll look at the actual playable contents here. So on the inside of the GM screen, there's a lot of useful info uh, for the GM, obviously. So basic stuff like the standard characteristic dice modifiers. So if your characteristic score is zero, your dice modifier is minus three, all the way up to 15 plus where you get a plus three modifier for your characteristic. Then we have a summary table of time frames, it's the increment of each time frame and the type of actions that take place in that time frame. So in the increments of seconds, we're talking about shooting, punching, jumping, combat round, which is six seconds. Maybe you could hurry a maths problem in that time. If you're talking about one minute, maybe you're applying first aid or doing a basic technical task. You know, if we're talking about four hours, you're researching problem for a day, maybe you're combing a city for a missing person. That helps you give, give an idea of what sort of time length we're talking about and whether the players might be able to do things quickly or screw up and take a bit longer or run into obstacles along the way. Then we have a summary of the task chain mechanic, one of the linchpin mechanics of Traveler. I'm not going to go into the mechanics of Traveler too much here because Seth Skorkowski has done a fantastic playlist that tells you everything you need to know about playing Traveler and he'll do a better job than I ever could. So I'll put a link to that in the description. But the basic idea of a task chain is that you have several characters who need to do several things in sequence to achieve a goal. So for example, if you want to get into jump space in your spaceship while you're being chased, then perhaps you have the engineer roll to fire up the jump drives while you know, you're know you under fire. The effect of their role, we have the effect results table here from exceptional failure down to exceptional success and everything in between. So the amount that they fail or pass the check by creates a dice modifier to the next check. So 
if the engineer does a good job with the engines, that could give a positive modifier to the astrogator who needs to calculate the jump. And that jump calculation, if that goes well, could give a positive bonus to the pilot who needs to actually get the ship into jump space. So that's just a simple example of a task chain. It works really well. It's an easy to understand mechanic, both for players and GMs, and it really helps the players feel like a team when they're doing something important like that with the starship. We've got a summary of task difficulties here from simple to plus all the way to impossible, which is 16 plus. We have a summary of what actually can be performed in a combat round. So one significant action, one minor action, or three minor actions. They can also perform any number of reactions and any number of free actions, but the referee can impose the limit according to circumstances. And then we've got a list of psionic range bands, important if you have a scion in your character group. Similarly, we have some more info on bands here. We've got the vehicle speed bands from stopped, gives a speed band number and then the equivalent in kilometers per hour, all the way up to hypersonic, which is speed band 10, and that's 6,000 kilometers per hour or more. But that's for aircraft that are bound to an atmosphere, to a planet. For spacecraft, the, the range bands are obviously quite uh, significant. If you're adjacent in space terms, you're within a kilometer or less, so you're really within kind of docking range or boarding range. Close would be 1 to 10 kilometers, short 11 to 1,250, so we're getting pretty big already. Medium 1251 to 10,000, then 10,001 to 25,000 for a long, 25,000 to 50,000 for very long, and distant would be anything more than 50,000. Although if you look in High Guard 2022, I believe there's an additional couple of range bands beyond that if you want to use capital ships with giant weapons and stuff. I can clearly see the MC screen here is designed for the Game Master running a more typical traveler campaign. So you have just a short-lived spacecraft scale weapons that would typically be used by a band of travelers in a relatively small ship, a far trader or a free trader. And so you have beam lasers, missile racks, nuclear missiles, particle barbettes, pulse lasers, and sandcasters, all very common weapons. It gives you their tech level, range damage, their tonnage where appropriate, their cost, and any special traits like some radiation effects or their smart. We've got a vehicle critical hit locations table, Got a radiation exposure table, which is pretty cool, followed immediately by a radiation effects table, which is very important. So if you run into the wrong side of the Imperium and they decide to fire a meson beam at you, you could suffer quite a lot of rads of damage and end up with losing endurance permanently, getting very sick, which would be bad. List of modifiers to spacecraft attacks. So you get bonuses for short range, for certain types of lasers, for every tons of the target. So the bigger the target, the easier it is to hit. And you get penalties for the distance, essentially. Then we have a damage scale. If a spacecraft is attacking a ground target, you get a minus two dice modifier to hit. Damage will be multiplied by 10. So spacecraft weapons are really powerful compared to ground weapons. And you get the reverse. If if you're a ground target firing at a spacecraft, um, your weapons do almost nothing to it. Your damage is going to be divided by 10. But your spacecraft weapon, if you're on the ground firing at a spacecraft or in space firing at a spacecraft, of course, will be just normal damage. We've also got missile flight length table here. So depending on the range band, which we can reference up here, it'll give you the rounds to impact for a given missile. And that can be helpful when your players are trying to strategy you know, how they want to try and thin out the incoming missile salvo. Finally, we've got the spacecraft critical hit location table, which again, is really valuable to use in space combat. We've got two more sides here to look at. So we've got the law level reference table. This is really handy. So different planets can have different law levels, which affects what kind of weapons, armor, and similar things you can actually legally carry in that world. So law level zero is, you know, a frontier lawless wasteland. Level one means only kind of WMDs and poison gas and stuff are, are banned in the most extreme form of combat armor and it increases in restriction from there up until nine plus where all weapons and all armor are not allowed to be carried around. Then we have some random encounter tables that are useful. So if you have an encounter starting, you can roll 2D to determine the range band where you discover your enemy. And then you can apply some modifiers depending on the type of terrain, whether you're in space, whether the target's in a vehicle, or whether the travelers are actively looking for danger in which case the dice modifier is the highest recon skill, which is quite nice. And then we have range bands here for ground combat. So much lower scale than spacecraft combat. We're looking at five meters is close range and very distant is over five kilometers. So it's, it's quite a difference. <laughs> we have a nice summary table of the main types of armor so that it gives you the amount of protection they provide which can be pretty massive for battle dress for heavier vac suits and for combat armor as you can see the tech level so the, the level of the uh, settlement you need to find to, to buy it the amount of rad protection it offers the weight in kilograms the cost in credits and any required skills so for anything combat armor and above you need some level of vac suit battle dress in fact requires vac suit 2 to wear so it's pretty tough to, to, to use if you're not specialized. Then we've got some bonuses for combat as well. So if you take an aiming action, which which is your significant action for the turn, you get plus one per action spent aiming when you finally do an attack roll. And you have to do a free action on your subsequent turns to keep 
aiming on the target. You get penalties though if the target is fast moving and they tell you how to calculate that. If you have a laser sight, you get plus one to hit if you're aiming. At short range, you get a general plus one, you know, but for other range of bands as well or target being in cover or a prone target, you will get penalties to hit. Then we've got a list of cover. So the type of cover from vegetation to stone wall to vehicle to fortifications and the amount of bonus protection they provide. Say it's a civilian vehicle or an armored vehicle, you could have it statted out as well so that it'll steadily take damage and eventually explode. Let's make things more exciting. And speaking of exploding, the last page here on the GM screen is lovely. We've got a huge list of common weapons. So we've got slug pistols. These are weapons that fire bullets and they include some cool stuff as well. The Gauss pistol uses a magnetic accelerant to fire the bullets, which can result in much faster traveling projectile and greater accuracy. And uh, so it gets an armor piercing trait and auto two, which is nice. And we've got slug rifles. The accelerator rifle is really good for zero G. Same with the snub pistol on the previous table because they don't provide any recoil. Then we've got some advanced combat rifles with scopes and auto fire, some more auto fire rifles, a Gauss rifle with arm, armor piercing five and auto three and a scope and a big old bulky shotgun. Then we've got some energy pistols, laser pistols and stunners of different types are a really common weapon and really useful for general traveler use. They're also not that expensive if you want to get your hands on a stunner. You have to pay extra for magazines and the cost of the weapon itself is listed here. And of course energy weapons are really good for zero G and stun weapons are really good. You can often take out enemies more quickly and with less mess. If you end up leaving a trail of dead bodies behind you, that can lead to problems with the authorities and that can snowball into all sorts of messes down the road. Then we got some energy rifles, so laser carbines, laser rifles, laser sniper rifles, and plasma rifles, which have quite a lot of damage at 6D. Traveler only uses D6, which is something I love about it. You just need a big pile of D6 to play. That's all, all you need. Then we got some melee weapons, which are really useful for particularly boarding actions. If you are defending against invaders on your ship or if you're invading a ship, these weapons are good to have on your person because you'll be able to get up close and personal in the restricted space on a typical spacecraft and you won't have any real risk of damaging the hull. Whereas if you're using slug pistols or explosives, you could blow a hole in the hull and cause all sorts of havoc. And speaking of which, we have grenades here at the end, aerosol grenades, frag, smoke, and stun grenades, all of which have their varying uses. Frag, of course, does a lot of blast damage. Stun grenades do 3D of stun damage and have a blast range of nine. Uh, they all have a blast range of nine, in fact. And smoke grenades can obviously give you some partial cover basically to help you escape a violent situation. So a very good GM screen. I think it's a definite improvement over the previous model, not just the artwork, but the layout. I think each page has a clear kind of focus. We've got sort of um, basic elements like modifiers, you know, task chains, effects, time frames. Then we move into vehicle and spacecraft stuff and missiles. Then we have law levels, encounters, cover, and, and armor, and then finally a page of weapons. So, you know, you'll quickly learn where to look to find the information you need for a particular type of encounter or situation you're having in the game. So, well done, Mongoose. By the way, this costs 15 quid, in case you were wondering. Well worth it. You can see as well the cardboard itself is super thick and sturdy as with the previous screen. Next, we'll take a fl quick flip through the Traveler Companion. So this is the 2024 update. Now the Traveler Companion, I would say, is one of the more valuable books to have in general, even before this update, because it contains a lot of interesting variant rules and a lot of more detailed rules that you can use for specific situations. The big addition in this one is that there's a chapter on vector-based space combat, which was not present in the previous Companion. And of course, there's been a lot of errata updates and little tweaks here there. I'm not fully aware of all the changes, but I do have the previous companion, so I'll, I'll make a comparison for myself at some point. But it's significantly longer than the previous one. I think it's about 15 or 16 added pages, something like that. So it's definitely, uh, I felt it was worth getting, and I am very interested in trying to use the vector-based space combat rules. Being that I'm a fan of The Expanse, I'm a fan of, you know, complex space combat games like Babylon 5 Wars, Starfleet Battles, all that kind of stuff. So it fits me down to the ground, really. So let's take a quick flip through and see what we got. So in the table of contents, we've got a lot of stuff here. We've got an introductory bit. Then we get into some optional characteristics that you can use in addition to the basic six characteristics that you get with your traveler. We have alternate methods of character creation, which are really handy if you have players who are really against the life path method, or if you just want to create characters quickly using a template, you can do that here. We have some more rules about allies, contacts, rivals, and enemies, some additional pre-career options, some additional careers, rules for training and experience, broad skills, and specialties and how they can be sort of broken down into more specific skills, alternate play styles, additional combat 
combat rules, additional gravity rules, atmosphere and vacuum, diseases, starvation and thirst, temperature, terrain and movement, animal encounters, vehicle damage, tips on refereeing traveler, interpreting UWP data, that's the universal world profiles that you find in any traveler map for a sector or subsector. A given system will have a set of what looks like hexadecimal numbers, and each of those numbers represents a, a characteristic of the key world in that system. Now, the World Generation Guide will let you flesh out that system fully with additional planets and moons and maybe lesser settlements. You could even have complex, you know, trinary, binary systems or black holes or whatever. But the UWP on the map will give you the key main settled world in that system, which is often the main place that you want to go. So it gives you a tip on, on how to understand that. Then we have a little bit of info about Traveler Map and the Wiki, which are great resources. Starports and spaceports, legalities and law breaking, slower than light travel, the jump drive, and some interesting ways to make that a little bit more dangerous, a little bit more uh, mysterious. Traveling in normal space, mine warfare, how to operate uh, around gas giants, typically to get more fuel, but there are various dangers, interesting things involved with that. Then we have transponders, registries, and mortgages for your ships, more detailed rules on missiles and torpedoes. Then we have our vector-based space combat, starship automation, so the use of AI, crew droids, that kind of stuff, I assume. Gravitic shielding and starship weaponry, so I'm not quite sure what we have waiting for us in there. It's interesting, the main author is Martin J. Doherty, who is a traveler machine. He's constantly producing these amazing quality source books. But then we have a separate credit for Dave Dyson for the vector-based space combat. So thanks, Dave. Uh, nice of you to add that option for us. So we have a little bit of an intro here. Again, we're just doing a flip through, so I'll just kind of briefly summarize. There are six new characteristics that are presented in the companion that can be added to your game, depending on how, what kind of game you want. So like Call of Cthulhu, you can add a wealth stat that kind of simplifies how you deal with character wealth and how many credits they have and so forth. You can also add a luck stat, which you can use to influence your rolls or to check against if you have a completely random outcome, have them roll luck and see who gets hit first. But altering chances of success is where it really feels like Call of Cthulhu. And I think I personally really like using luck for that because Traveler can be quite deadly. So, and since you're using 2d6, a plus one or plus two can be a huge difference between life and death or taking out the enemy that is really bogging your party down or the spacecraft that is chasing you. It makes the game just a tiny bit more cinematic but not enough to alter the hard scrabble feel of a traveler campaign. Then we got morale. So this is really good to apply to enemies. So to give them realistic reactions that they might run away if they're outnumbered. And also if you're running a military or mercenary campaign or a naval campaign, then morale can be really important. Although the naval campaigns have their own crew efficiency index mechanic for the crew of the whole ship. If you take out, say, an away party with you, uh, with your characters, you may need to know how likely those guys are to stand up when there's something rough happens on the ground level. So to give you tips on using all these stats, we have sanity as well. If you want to bring in a horror element, use a little bit of Call of Cthulhu influence or, you know, the effects of meeting particularly alien aliens or seeing uh, particularly horrible atrocities during war, stuff like that. Uh, we also have social standing. So it's kind of tied to the concept of a noble hierarchy, but they note that that might not be present in all societies. So they give you a way to interpret the SOC stat more generally and some tips on the effective SOC. So kind of your official standing, but that can be modified depending on how people perceive you or what titles you've been awarded, etc. So then we have alternate traveler creation. So this is really useful. First of all, you have the Iron Man rules. So if you want to go classic traveler, it's very simple. All you need to do is when you roll your survival roll at, at the, the end of your term, if you fail the survival roll, your character is dead and you start over. That's the way it used to be in the early days of the system. And if you want that feeling back, there it is. Is. They also give you tips on solo character generation, so rather than connections rules, the referee should give you a list of organizations you can be tied to, stuff like that. Instead of taking a skill package, you can just pick any skill you want at level 1. Then there's alternate methods of determining your characteristics. So either the boon dice method, which is what I favor, so you instead of rolling 2d for all 6 stats, or potentially more if you're using the additional one, you can give a boon on 2 of those rolls. That means the player rolls 3 dice and picks the 2 highest. I think that's a really nice thing to do because because sometimes the dice can be cruel and you really want players to be able to focus on a career that they're really interested in. So I allow them to do the boon dice method and they can pick which statistics they will use the boon dice on so that they have a better chance of getting a high stat in what they need to become a scout or an agent or whatever they want to be. The other is the assignment method. So you roll 12D and write down the value of each dice and then you can assign dice individually against different stats until you run out. And if you want more heroic travelers, you can allow players to delete any two of those dice scores and replace them with two fives and they can be added in the same way. So it's a, a little bit more flexible for you know determining your individual stats. Either I think is really good to use, particularly for players new to the system, but I 
I prefer the Boondice method. It mixes a bit of the old school and the new school, and I find that appealing. Some advice on term limits. We've got a nice little bit about the Bwaps. So these are a kind of lizard folk. They get negative modifiers to strength and endurance, but they have the trait of structured mind. So they're excellent administrators, and they receive a permanent boon on all admin and science checks. But they get a bane on testing for psionic potential. So if you want a lawyer on your team, they might want to be a Bwap because they'll be excellent at all that kind of stuff. Now we have a really nice method that I plan to use for an intro traveler game quite soon, actually, which is package-based creation. And this just simplifies down the whole character creation system beautifully. So here you just have four steps. You create and assign your characteristics, which I use the Boon Dice method. Then you choose a background package, which are laid out here. Then you choose a career package, and then you finalize a traveler. And that's it. So instead of doing the, the normal background skills and the first term for your traveler, what you do in this version is you just get your characteristics. You take the background package and go immediately into your career. So the background package encompasses both your normal background skills and your kind of education, assuming that you you know have that kind of background. So what backgrounds do we have? Well, we have Belter, who gets things like basic astrogation, Jack of all trades one, which is awesome, profession Belter two, backsuit one, you know, useful stuff. We've got colonists who get Jack of all trades one, mechanic, medic, navigation, survival, stuff that really helps you last uh, out there in the harsh frontier worlds. If you're from a developed world, then you'll get things like admin, advocate, diplomat, driving, wheeled vehicles, flying vehicles, any profession you want, any science you want, streetwise. So here you've come from a very civilized world. You've had lots of education, and so your skills kind of reflect that. If you're from the fringe, then you'll be skilled in things like de uh, deception, gambling, gun combat, recon, and stealth. So this is more of your Han Solo and Chewie kind of vibes. You're on the fringes of civilization. You need to be on your toes, uh, and the skills give you that capacity. From a low-tech world, you'll get skills and things like animals, carousing, archaic gun combat, you know, languages in your local dialect, melee weapons, any profession uh, that would be suitable for a low-tech world at two, plus recon, streetwise, and survival, which would be really useful on a low-tech world. Then we got the opposite of that, Metropolis, you come from the big city. Notice as well that for each package you get benefits automatically, so they fit with the individual background, and you also get modifiers to certain stats. So develop world, you get plus one education, whereas if you're low tech, you get a lot of skills, 5,000 credits and some kind of melee weapon, but you lose three education points and you gain two endurance. So it gives you your character a flavor already just from adding this package. So Metropolis, again, we're from the big city. You come with 10,000 credits and a portable computer. You got admin, advocate, broker. So you know how to do trading, you know how to do diplomacy, you know how to drive, deal with electronics, comms or computers, and you get streetwise as well. So you're used to growing up on the mean streets of the concrete jungle. You could be a space habitat person, so you've got a skill in vac suit, plus you've got a bit in astrogation, electronics, engineer, uh, mechanic, science, and, and stuff like that. Finally, we have water worlds. So here, you get plus one to your endurance, and then you get navigation, seafarer, and survival, and stuff that relates to growing up on a world full of water where you'd have to sail around. So at this point now, you've basically done your, what would normally be your background step and your first term in Traveler, where you, you know, you can have a pre-career options. And then we go to our career packages. A, a career package is equivalent to a full career in the chosen area, and you'd only take one. Then you roll 3D for how many years the Traveler has aged, um, and that doesn't need to correspond to a normal career length. You just add that number to your uh, starting age of 18. Or, well, I guess it'd be 22 at this point because you're starting your career. So then we have a bunch of career packages, which I won't go into in too much detail, but they're pretty self-explanatory. They also give you some modifiers to your base characteristics plus benefits. And the benefits here are more significant. So it's it's assumed that you spent some time in this career. So if you're an admin, you end up at rank four. You've got 75,000 credits to your name and three former colleagues as contacts. Plus you've got admin three, broker one, diplomat one. And by the way, an important element of this template method of creation is that the skills all stack. So for example, if my background gives me advocate one and then I take administrator and get advocate one, it actually becomes advocate two. And that way nothing is wasted in this method. Agent, so you work for an intelligent agency, law enforcement, that kind of thing. You end up at rank two field agent. You've got some credits, you've got a pistol and a few contacts, gain skills in electronics, deception, carouse, gun combat, investigate two, streetwise two, stealth one, recon one. Barbarian, you get rank two warrior with a blade or a staff. You gain melee blade two. Two, recon, stealth, and survival uh, as well, really useful. If you're a citizen, so you're out there in a mid to high technology society, but not too much adventure, so your skills are more intellectual, if you like, and you gain another point of education. You got some money in the bank, a couple of contacts, and then your skills are mostly focused around things like art, admin, advocate, deception, diplomat, electronics, persuade, science, that kind of stuff. If you're a corsair, that means you're a pirate, so you end up with rank two, corporal, 15,000 credits, and a submachine gun or something similar, and two former crew members 
of contacts. And then you get some really cool skills, including electronics, any gun combat, any gunner, which means you can fire starship guns. Mechanic, uh, melee, any uh, streetwise, and vac suit 2, which would allow you to wear really high level combat armor. Then we have marines. So here you've been a member of a space going military or marine unit. So you're trained for both planet side and shipboard action. You're used to wearing vac suits and combat dress and you gain dexterity and education. You come out at rank of corporal with an assault rifle, some credits and some contacts. You have skills in electronics, athletics, explosives, any gun combat, gunner, heavy weapons, medic, recon, and vac suit 2, which is again fantastic. Medic. So here you get some social standing bonus, which is nice. A lot of credits because you make a lot of money being a doctor. A medic kit and two contacts. And then you get appropriate skills in admin, uh, medic 3, investigate 1, persuade, science, useful stuff. For enlisted military, you'll end up at rank 2, corporal, a bit less money and just one contact compared to a marine, but you get plus 2 endurance. So you, you've been on the front lines, you know how to survive, I've gotten tougher. Explosives, gun combat 3 is amazing heavy weapons one mechanic one recon one but notice the lack of vac suit skills so probably uh, you might want to take those at your completion stage you be a military officer so that makes you a captain you gain some education you got a goss pistol one contact and you have appropriate skills for your rank like diplomacy leadership but you still have gun combat, recon, and tactics military, which is really useful in a fight. You can be a noble, which gives you a minor noble title, some ed education, quite a bit of money, and three contacts in the nobles, admin, or military. And your skills are all focused on the type of stuff that nobles do. Admin and advocate, art, brokering trades, carousing, diplomat two, which is really useful, gambling, leadership two, and persuade one, which is great. Performer, you don't have much money, but you gain a bit of intelligence. You've got art three, carouse of two, so you're really good at socializing, deception one, Persuade one. Steward, which is really useful because steward skill lets you take luxury passengers on your spaceship. You can do high passage and charge passengers much more money to travel on your ship. You got Rogue. You're living on the fringe of society. Again, this is your Han Solo kind of archetype. Gain some int and lose some social standing. You've got two contacts in the underworld and you gain more skills in athletics, gun combat, gambling, deception, streetwise, recon, stealth, that sort of stuff. Scholar, you've got decent money. You gain some int and education. You got some contacts in academics or publishing. And then you've got scholarly skills like uh, diplomacy, art, electronics, investigation, navigation, science, plus persuade one. A scout, so this is a really useful one for the crew, of course, because you end up with astrogation one. You get bonus to your intellect, 25,000 credits, three contacts who are also spacers. Astrogation, electronics, computers, jack of all trades one, gun combat, vac suit one, pilot starship, you know, these are all really useful things for a crew who are going to be flying around in charted space. You'd be a straight up spacer, so you gain some decks. Two contacts, a little bit of money. You get some electronics and engineering skills, plus gunner, mechanic, pilot, steward, again, very useful, and vac suit three. So you're really, really good at vac suits and dealing with problems on the outside of the hull. Command level spacer, then you'll come out at a higher rank, lieutenant or fourth officer. A lot more credits, but only one ally would be a former colleague or government official. You gain some int for this, and you'll have good skills in astrogation, leadership, persuasion, piloting starship at two, which is great, a lot of experience, and vac suit one as well again useful finally we've got the wanderer so you're just a space going bum running around from one world to another you don't get any stat bonuses you get very little credits but you get three contacts and an ally so people find you likable and you get an interesting mix of skills corrals deception drive gun combat uh most of these are at zero but you get unarmed melee at one recon one stealth one steward one streetwise two and vac suit one because you're used to being in space then when you finalize the traveler this is actually very simple so you have these three different areas here, career, traveler skills, and benefits. Basically, you tailor the traveler to what you want them to do by getting one option from each of these categories. So for career, you can increase any one skill offered at level one or above to level four, which means you're super awesome at that skill, like PhD level. Or you could increase any three skills by uh, at any level by one each to a maximum of two. Or you could leave the service at rank four, but with no extra skills. That can be useful at times as well, depending on how you want your standing to be. Then we've got the traveler skills. So you can choose Choose any of the skill pairs listed below, both at level one. So things like vac suit and steward, gunner and mechanic, pilot and electronics, gun combat and recon. You know, these are all really useful stuff. And then finally, you'll pick one mustering out benefit. So it could be a ship share, 100,000 in cash, combat implants, one ally and two contacts, traveler's aid association membership, or you could buy uh, one more point of social standing. 
So that's pretty cool. Then we have a point by method, which is more complex, so we'll get into that. But basically, 250 points you're given to buy your characteristics, select your background skills to then buy skills. And you can also select additional benefits or drawbacks with your points. If you pick drawbacks, that gives you more points back into your skill point pool so you can buy some additional skills. So there's a little bit of that trade off between advantages and disadvantages they get in systems like GURPS or Hero, where you use point based creation. So I thought that's a really nice touch. Again, it's more complicated than the other methods, but um, I really like the, te the template one, and I've been testing it recently against the standard method of travel creation. I find they tend to come out with a bit less variety in skills, but stronger skill values. So it kind of all comes out in the wash in the end and can work out really well for a beginning party. So I'm definitely going to use that to entice some people to play. Point by, I think, is a, is a step too far, but would be good for people who are coming in from the GURPS end of things. I think, you know, as a game master, I tend to be flexible, so I would probably allow any of these. The players can make a good argument for why they wanted to create a character that way. Then we got some info about allies, contacts, rivals, and enemies. So the level of relationship, what the terms are referring to. So an ally is a close relationship. You've got all affinity and no enmity. A contact you've got some affinity and some enmity arrival you've got less affinity a little bit more enmity hopefully depending on the roles and with the enemy you've got no affinity and all enmity so that's what those terms uh, relate to when you're rolling for affinity enmity you roll 2d and you get your results from this table um, so then it just determines you know how your relationship is with this person these tables give you an idea of you know for a given level of affinity or enmity how much they hate or love you respectively depending on which one you have and they give you notes as well to clarify what these things mean um, and how far they're willing to go for example somebody is blinded by hatred I have a, a enmity minus six they may even engage in self-destructive actions in order to harm the traveler or put innocents at risk so they really hate you like really really bad you can also determine their power and influence which can be important and again we have tables for those to clarify what those mean and you roll on a 2d get a value from one to six it's just a nice little way to flesh out the contacts allies enemies system and then the, the player can start to put names and, and faces to those ideas and, and shape them into a real useful part of the game then there's some special characteristics you can roll on a d66 table which is really handy as well and you can also end up with rolls at the very end here where you roll two more or three more special characteristics so they could be very eccentric in other words then we've got some new pre-career options so if you don't want to do the university or the military academy as in the core rule book but you want to do something different you could do a colonial upbringing which gives you different uh, graduation benefits you could do the merchant academy so this is about you know those who want to embark on a career aboard merchant starships or if you want to be a broker of goods a trader of some kind again you get different graduation outcomes graduation benefits you have the psionic community so if you're born into a community where psionics are used which would probably be outside the Imperium since it's highly illegal. If you're allowing psionics in the campaign from the start for people to choose that role, then they could choose this background and gain a, a benefit from being in a psionic community from the start. We also have the School of Hard Knocks. So these are, again, people growing up on the fringes. So the Han Solo school of growing up. So they gain skills and things like streetwise and graduation, if you want to call it that. They will gain some skills like gun combat carouse and stuff like that. And they'll lose social standing, which is kind of funny. Spacer communities is the last option. So if you really want to head up into a career in space, then you know perhaps you grew up on an orbital habitat or a belter community or in some kind of space-born or space-related kind of community. Community. So you'll end up with skills and things like vac suit, astrogation, and stuff like that. And there's some, again, new graduation outcomes and benefits. And then we got some additional careers as well. We've got the truther. So this is someone who seeks or claims to know or knows the truth about some fringe subject. So they're defined by the truth they seek or the knowledge they have. There's not a con conventional rank system, but instead they have a new characteristic, which is called following that replaces your sock skill. So the more standing you have as a truther, the more followers you have. So you're kind of a cult leader in a sense. You can also be a believer. So you're part of a formal religious order. You can define the tenets of what that religion is like. So it could be some kind of unified interstellar mythology or you know, whatever else so you want really. And then most benefits of believer career are spiritual. You could end up with perhaps some legendary status as an icon in this belief system who others want to emulate. And you could even be a sainthood candidate if you're good enough. It's pretty crazy. And then we have our skills tables for those new careers of true and believer so you can see as with every traveler career they've got appropriate you know mustering out benefits uh, requirements skills and training you know they've got the following mechanics here for the truthers and a mishap table and the events table 
Likewise, for the believer, there's no qualification. Anybody can be this. Um, and then you choose your assignment, being mainstream believer, a missionary, or a holy warrior. You get some unique mustering out benefits for this. <laughs> there's various ranks and bonuses, depending on which pathway you take. And then you have your mishaps table and an events table on the facing page. Then we have rules about training and experience. So I think in the previous core rulebook for 2E, there were rules about experience points and those were then moved to the companion after the release of core book 2022. I think there were some mixed feelings about that, but not everybody wants to use experience. They just want to stick with the rules for training for skills. So they give you options here on you know how to do both really. So if you want to improve your stats through training in, in skills or characteristics, you'll need to really focus on it and be full time and have somebody teaching you or guiding you which could be one traveler teaching you another, but you can only get up to one level below them. So if somebody is vac suit two, they can get you up to vac suit one, but they can't get you up to their same level. Um, you can also get experience points for at the end of an adventure. So they recommend giving out one experience point with a bonus point for good role playing or if they did something really cool. If it's a very long adventure or campaign, then during a suitable break in the action, you might say, well, look, here's a couple of experience points. Spend them as you want. These points have to be allocated immediately to a skill or characteristic you're trying to develop. You should note down, you know, somewhere where you apply points to a given skill or characteristic and it gives you then the cost for doing so so gaining skills the cost to gain a level goes higher and higher and higher you can also increase your characteristics through different types of training these are about physical characteristics here and then we have how you can gain int or education as well we've got skills and specialities so this is about having the broader skills and how they can be divided into some specialties if you like so art is a skill in itself, uh, but you could subdivide that into performing, creative, presentation, and then different subcategories within that. Profession skill could deal with very potentially very general areas of work, so profession crew member on a spaceship, stuff like that. Um, so this tells you how to work with that, and you can subdivide that into things like colonist, crew member, freeloader, spacer, sportsman, worker, colonist, freeloader, scrounger, freeloader security, spacer slash belter, spacer slash crew member, sports slash various, worker in metalworking, worker in armory. And then there are some different broad areas of science as well, but you can add some more specialities here. So um, within life sciences, physical sciences, robotic sciences, social sciences, and space sciences, they give you some additional specialisms there. And then in melee skill as well, if you want to get more detailed about that and let people do different fighting styles, or perhaps they work on a grappling-based system, or if they're using a striking-based system, or if they're a fencer, so they're really good with, with the sword. Then we have alternate play styles, which include some cool stuff like narrative task resolution. You can add a narrative component into your traveler game. You don't have to be fully simulationist. Every traveler is entitled to a number of narrative events per game session tied to their skills and characteristics. And that essentially replaces a skill or characteristics to check under normal conditions and would be used to narrate something positive, but there's nothing to stop a, tra a traveler narrating some minor disaster where they fail to accomplish their goals if they feel like it makes sense. More commonly, you would just use this to automatically complete a task and turn it back to the referee to decide what to do with that. But a narrative event can't be used to make the impossible achievable, so there's limits on that. And you can't use it against another traveler, but it can be used to harm an NPC. So using this basically allows you to create a more cinematic style. If you're coming in from, say, a Star Wars FFG or a system like that, where a cinematic, pulpy style really works for you, then this could really get a little bit of that feel into the game. Then there's the mundane events check. So this is just about, you know, sometimes it's necessary or interesting to determine how well you do a task that's not covered by a specific skill. So you would just roll 2d against an average difficulty and then work out the effect and decide what happens so and then there's also recognition of competence so often you know a traveler should be assumed to be competent in the basic parts of a trained skill and so they shouldn't have to roll for certain basic things I, I definitely think that's a nice thing to add to the game you don't want people to feel like you know they're getting screwed over too often by the dice when their skill is supposed to represent a huge level of competence particularly at three or four and, and above so I, I think that should be a rule that a lot of GMs should look that seriously. Then we've got some additional combat rules. These are all optional. So you can do things like tracking ammunition expenditure for guns, determining the reload threshold based on the ammo capacity relative to the normal mode of operation. Then we've got a nice table to, to simplify that. Using endurance. Endurance represents the traveler's ability to shrug off damage and, and harm. They give you some variations to this. So you could have like natural resilience. So the ENDDM 
goes negative, that means you add damage to each attack, which makes things even deadlier. You could also have a knockout blow. So if you get hit for, to endurance zero by a single attack, then you're knocked out instantly despite having two characteristics above zero. There's also random first blood. So typically you apply any damage to END first, but it could be that, you know, the first attack goes to any characteristic and it would make characters with low END more survivable. They also have an alternative initiative system, some rules for material destruction, different values of protection and structure for typical inanimate objects, which is good if you want to apply, you know, cover that is tearing apart as it gets shot up and stuff like that. Some additional wound effects, which is great if you want some more, you know, impact from a rough combat. You can have disabling wounds. You can also have combat mishaps. So that's where you roll a double one and it's also a failure. I find that a little bit harsh maybe. I do like hit locations though in games so I, I tend to use this one so depending on where you get hit then you know that might change the wound effect. So in here they give you a guide to that so if you get hit in the head and get a big wound which would be somewhere between half your end score and your full end score then you would get dice modifier minus one on all checks for arms you know all checks involving handling things. For torso it would be uh, reducing your speed and your physical checks. For your legs it would reduce your speed and uh, all movement based checks. And then they have a secondary table for severe wounds, which is even worse. Your legs could be disabled and you can only hobble and you can't move at all. Then we have some rules on unusual creatures that don't have normal sort of hit locations. We've got dealing with weapon scanners and searches. So, you know, if you want to disguise a weapon, how difficult is it going to be? What are the ways you can do that? How to avoid getting caught in direct searches, technological searches where, you know, you're being subject to scanners. And then what to do if you get caught? Try to make a persuade or diplomat check basically with the world's law level as a negative dice modifier. So if you're trying to sneak a weapon into a world with law level 9, you're probably not going to make it. <laughs> you're probably not going to persuade them to let you through. <laughs> then we got some new rules on gravity, microgravity, minimal gravity, very low gravity, low G, standard gravity, which is around about Earth gravity, high gravity, which is 1.4 Gs to 1.8 Gs, extreme gravity, upper to 1.8 G, which is dangerous for, for people like us operating 1 G. And then they give you some impacts of these different levels of gravity, how to deal with falling in different G levels, how to deal with soft and hard landings in different G levels, collisions and falling objects, damage from falling objects, damage from collisions, which would be more severe on high G worlds. Then similarly, we have a section for additional detail on atmosphere and vacuum. So hard vacuum is obviously atmosphere zero. Partial vacuum, so you need full protective PPE of some kind, but it will kill you a little bit slower than hard vacuum. Trace atmosphere is not breathable, but will not kill you immediately. So you could survive for at least a few minutes if you get to an air supply. Then we go upwards and better from there uh, until we get to dense and extremely dense atmospheres. So you feel like you're drowning at this point. And super dense, basically you can't do anything uh, as a human to survive this. The pressure is so severe that you suffer physical damage and just get crushed. So then they talk about uh, the specifics of this, uh, breathing difficulties, the problems of decompression into different levels of partial or hard vacuum, vacuum in low pressures, what happens if you have a partial exposure or a suit breach, leaving you partially exposed to vacuum, and the opposite end, what happens in high pressures, including extreme pressures, and what happens to starships in high pressures. Different starships will be able to survive, and different starship systems will be able to survive at different levels of pressure. And also underwater environments. That rarely comes up in my experience, but when it does come up, you'll be glad to have these rules and guidance for that. Then we've got rules for diseases and toxins. Very useful. Detecting toxic agents, exposure, the delay before symptoms manifest. Rolling to resist a toxic agent. Some sample agents like neurotoxins, extremely lethal biotoxins, pepper sprays, that sort of stuff. Diseases and biological hazards. And then we got some cool space diseases and weaponized anthrax, which is something we know about today. Uh, in fact, spacer flu and tilt fever. I like those. Then we have acids and other corrosives, which can be real nasty. Then the impact of starvation and thirst, which hopefully won't come into your game unless your travelers are super lost and screwed. But yeah, it just gives you an idea of what happens when you lack enough food. When you're short of water, if you end up on a desert planet, like a Rakus type of thing. Similarly, we have effects of temperature, and that will vary depending on what you're being exposed to. So if it's molten metal or rock, you're going to get 6 damage, 6D damage per round, which is pretty much non-survivable. <laughs> Hypothermia on the opposite end as well. Uh, what happens if you get heat stroke? So, you know, all these rules, again, are, are kind of optional, but if you're wanting to make the terrain features of a given world a major challenge, then it's useful to have these as an additional sort of level of detail and immersion for the for the players. Then we got some more general stuff on terrain conditions and movement, including vehicular mishaps, chances of problems if you're flying in cluttered airspace, using hazardous terrain, so wetlands, forests, jungles, shrublands, arctic terrain, mountainous terrain, deserts, 
aquatic terrain, and of course vacuum again. Atmospheric conditions like winds, hurricanes, all that kind of stuff. Landing modifiers, so if you're trying to land in difficult terrain, how hard is it going to be? So you need to make a pilot check, you know, make sure you have a suitable landing site, but if you're trying to land in a difficult winds or difficult conditions, you can end up drifting from your intended landing site. And a, a table for what happens if you're trying to land in the wilderness, where there's not really a clear area to set yourself down. Then we got some hot tips on animal encounters. So they have some traits that can be given to animals, including clever, they might be flo floaters, they might be composed of energy or explosive. They could be gigantic. They could be gossamer or particulate or just strange, which inspires fear. They can be tough, toxic, or they can survive in vacuum. There aren't many of those, but there are a few. And then we have some sample creatures, which is always nice. Alverson's Nightmare is quite a horrible name for something. We've got Kenderson's Gray Mass, which is a big, gross blob. We've got this adorable thing, the River Dipper. And we've got the sting storm, a flying lizard thing, a peak floater, which is explosive, uh, a floater, and gossamer. So you got to watch out for if your immediate reaction to shoot them, you might blow yourself up. you got the curvin, vaguely arachnoid creatures. Gross. But they have stealth one, because they can crawl about on ceilings and stuff, and they have natural armor as well. Um, so quite a nice selection of additional creatures here, which is handy. You know, a lot of names in Traveler are generated by random syllable tables that are linked to different cultures in the classic Traveler universe, so you don't always want to pronounce some of these. <laughs> Gotta come up with something easier. Scree! I like that name. So they're kind of a nasty bat-type thing that can peck you, and they sound off an alarm that can attract their comrades. We got all kinds of weird stuff here. Boot wrap, a uh, spongy mass that can trap you and slowly digest you. Never good. Got some aquatic creatures, the cuddle horror with lots of eyeballs, a pointer fish, the lake fang, the swamp queen. Got exotic aquatic creatures. Here we have a angry lobster, seems like. Uh, but it can survive in vacuum. Yeah, 16 hits, so pr pretty tough. Got the death cloud. Yeah, pretty dramatically named, as it says. It slowly digests you. It's an omnivore, so it'll eat anything, and it can survive in vacuum. We have Shade, which is some kind of free energy phenomenon that manifests as a pool of darkness, creating an area of dimness and cold. So they drain you 1D of damage per round just by contact, and their behavior is inexplicable. Interesting. Got algae worms, got the Kasman, some kind of armored bear. That's what the world needs. A gross low bug thing. And species O8171, the hull net. So they're native to the upper atmospheres of gas giants. And if you get entangled in one, they can screw up your systems with their powerful bioelectric field and potentially drag you down into the deeper levels of the gas giant, which could crush you and kill you. So that's fun. Then we got some additional optional rules for vehicle damage. So particularly dealing with anti-personnel weapons. So it recommends that you reduce damage from anti-personnel weapons against vehicles because they are they should be tougher basically then we got some rules uh not rules but tips on refereeing traveler play balance is not really a thing in traveler you'd be used to that if you're playing D, &D 5e for example or pathfinder traveler is an old school game in in that sense so it's frequently expected that you'll run into situations that are way beyond your pay grade and you'll need to back off and find another way to approach it it also says that the referee should be ruthless if you you do something really stupid so try not to do that this is not a game where you are an invincible hero this is a game where you're typically very vulnerable until you've had a lot of time running about the universe scraping together credits and buying yourself some armor and things everybody is squishy everybody can die at a moment's notice so play balance is, is not really a thing it's similar to call of cthulhu and i really like that approach same in rune quest and, and other of these types of games i mean in the real world that feels lived in you can easily run into something that's beyond your ken it takes away that kind of gamey feel that you get with dnd5 or, or pathfinder or two, which are both games that I enjoy playing. I want to make that clear, but you know, you get a specific experience with that, and that's not what Traveler is for. They give some tips on creating alien and human societies, creating adventures and hooks, some basic themes like hostage situations, disasters, exploration, just getting from A to B could be an adventure in itself, as if it's a difficult planet side travel or space travel while you're on the run or something like that. Maybe you get a distress signal, maybe somebody breaks a contract with you, maybe it's some kind of horror going on, like a mystery you need to investigate or you could be stuck in a war zone and need to get out. And in general, you should 
encourage good guy behavior. You know, you don't want your characters to be cynical, back alley gangsters, execution style shooting people. That's not what makes Traveler the most enjoyable and rewarding. Then we got the interpretation of UWP data, which again, you can get from Seth Skorkowski rather than my much less well produced videos. Then some tips on using Traveler map in the wiki. So how you can contribute, how you can use these in your game. Uh, the Traveler map is an amazing resource. Some of the stuff is basically fan canon. So you do have to watch out for that. You know, if you go beyond the areas that have been specifically delineated in official supplements from GDW or currently from Mongoose, then you might be getting into stuff that fans have made. Some of it is really good, but just make sure that you know what you're getting into. And they explain the places where Charged its base is basically set, which is just this tiny little bit. Now we know the, the galaxy is a barred spiral. It's nice to see they represent that. Um, then, you know, we see the, the zooming in of charges to base from the furthest level. Then we start to see the different polities laid out. Then we get down to the 10 parsec scale. We start to see sectors. Then we start to see subsectors. Then the one parsec scale, we start to see starport classes, trade zones, and the X boat routes, the courier routes. And then if you zoom in further, you can click on individual star systems and get information about them. It's really great. So even if you don't have... A sector book to hand you know you can use the wiki while your players are traveling to say i want to go over here and you go oh shit what do i do well look at the uwp which you can get from traveler map and come up with something that way and you can give them something to do while they're waiting around being refueled or whatever there's also a world map generator on traveler map which is really good yeah you can also generate custom worlds but now that there's the world generation guide i would recommend that you use that if you want something more detailed we've also got additional info about starports and spaceports which is really handy so we rate them in the uwps by class you know a through e and x x just means there's no port at all e is like a frontier installation there's no facilities really and a is where you've got lots of trade you know shipbuilding, all kinds of cool stuff and you can detail them further you can have port features different kinds of ports with different atmospheres especially Specialist ports like launch facilities, military ports, and the effects of port features. You know, what what would be restricted, um, what you could gain from being in these kind of places. We've got a port events table if you need something to happen that could be perhaps the driver for a new adventure. And again, different types of installations you might find like army bases, defense bases, maintenance facilities, naval depots, research facilities, shipyards, all that kind of stuff. And then how starport law and defenses work. So depending on the class, they'll have different levels of enforcement and security. If you're on this table, it'll determine what kind of law enforcement you have and how they behave, essentially. Starport itself will have defenses. So that will be, you know, defensive weapons they may have to try and avoid takeover by hostile forces. And there's a table here as well that you roll on. So you can end up all the way up to a fortress, which would be a heavily armored and equipped starship grade bay weapons, plus a flotilla of fighters and system defense boats. So very hard to just randomly attack and take over. Think about Babylon 5, that kind of level. Then we got some details on legalities and law breaking. Nice little table here of the severity of your crime from insignificant to horrific. So horrific would be a once in a generation atrocity. <laughs> and it would give you dice modifier to the law level of plus five. Uh, give you potentially a huge bounty if you escape or a really horrible sentence or even execution if you get caught. So and talked about extradition treaties, weapons related crime and different categories of those. Obtaining weaponry that's restricted, under the counter weapons, so black market stuff, and stolen weapons, which will tend to have maybe some faults or, you know, they could be overpriced or all that kind of stuff. A little bit of hot tips on slower than light travel. It's possible to take slower than light travel interstellar, but that would be sleeper ships or robotic explorers or remnants from previously extinct races in the, the modern charted space universe. Everybody has some kind of jump drive access, which is explained more in this chapter. Jump masking is a phenomenon that happens when, you know, if you try and get in to a system where there's a strong gravity source and you're quite close, you know, you could be kind of screwed over, essentially, by getting too close to the gravity source. There's also jump variants, so if you want your jumps to be a little bit more exciting, you can add a distance variance and a time variance, depending on the distant variance would come from the astrogator's effect roll on their astrogation roll. Time variance would come from the engineer's effect on their engine activation roll. You know, some of the rolls indicate a bad jump. Those can be real bad. You end up with physical effects like nausea, you know, vomiting, headaches, all kinds of stuff. You can even be incapacitated for a bit then you can also have mental effects like paranoia irritability breakdown and very bad jumps 
So if you get bo bad jump on both of the previous tables, then the effects are magnified. So you have to recalibrate the jump drive. You need major or minor repairs. Jump space intrusions might occur. The jump drive might just be destroyed when you come out. Or you could get severe jump space intrusions and your drive is destroyed. So a missed jump is an interesting one because if you roll two or less, you're lost in jump space and everybody dies. If you roll three to four, you miss jump 1D times 1D parsecs in a random direction. So you can go really far, but it'll not be where you want to go. The miss jumps get steadily less rough as you get higher. So 11 to 12 is just a rough jump, and you emerge at 100 times 2D diameters from the target world. So you've got to fly through the in-system space for longer. And then they give you general concepts of jump space and, you know, some things you could add to jump space, like special currents that allow you faster jumps along certain routes. You could make jump space weirder by having jump space phenomena or making missed jumps more common, stuff like that. You could even emerge in the wrong time frame or in some pocket universe or something weird. You could also have regions in the charted space where you have high variance of the length of jumps. You can also have alternate jump drives, so you could do instant jumps, as in Dune, where the, the highliner just disappears and then reappears where it needs to be instantly, anywhere in the universe. It's less so here because you still need to be within your jump drive's limitations, but it changes all the rules of the setting, basically. So the way that space combat is conducted, you know, the, the one week delay of jump space has a huge impact on how the world of charted space is organized. So if you change that, you want to be real sure that that's what you want to do. The second variant, real space transfer, transit is for people who like warp drive essentially so the jump rating just tells you how long you can travel ftl speeds in real space so if you have a jump to ship then you would warp over two par two parsecs in a week basically or one parsec in three and a half days and since you're in real space you can still receive comms and change course so that does have economic ramifications and stuff like that there'd be a little bit less of an impact, uh, I think, than having instant jumps, where entire source books like the new Imperial Navy source book would be totally invalidated by instant jumps. Real space transits, you still have the time lag issue, so you can kind of sideline some of those problems. Then we have a bit more detail on traveling in normal space. So working through travel in a system, dealing with movement and navigation in real space, orbital mechanics and interplanetary travel, the kind of interplanetary distances that are typical, and notes on using traveler formulae. Then we have some optional rules for mine warfare. So this can be pretty rough, I think, but very relevant for if you're doing a naval campaign or a mercenary campaign. So there are explosive mines, captor mines, nuclear proximity mines, and nuclear laser mines. So laser mines are cool. Use a small nuke to pump a one-shot, extremely powerful x-ray laser. They don't have as much power as like a straight-up nuclear explosion, but they do have significant radiation effects, similar to a nuclear blast, and they can do 5D of damage to a single target, whereas as a nuke mine, you might get more damage, but it's quite crude and would be easier to detect. Then we've got some additional stuff on dealing with minefield density, how difficult it would be to navigate, uh, mines and mine laying equipment, and how to detect and evade minefields. Then we've got our gas giant operations, which is really useful. So the deeper you go in a gas giant, the better fuel you're going to get quicker, but the deeper you go, the more chance you run into bad stuff like those gossamer net creatures that can catch you. And if you go too far down, then you really have to worry about damage to the ship, power loss to the ship, and potentially being lost forever. If you go into the abyssal depths, then forget it. So most Starfaring species can't even build a ship that can survive at that level. Uh, and of course, one of the other things is that ships will, in, in highly trafficked systems, you might end up with pirates and corsairs hanging out in the kind of lower depths of the gas giant atmospheres to catch refuelers while they're unawares. That can be another hazard to look for. Then we got a chapter on transponders, ship transponders, active and passive transponders, IFF, so identifying friend or foe. So it's generally used by Navy and paramilitary vessels only. You can modify your transponders, but that has risks, of course. Then we get into missiles and torpedoes. So there's some additional options here like dogfight missiles for point defense. They can take out small craft or other missiles. Interceptor missiles for area defense. So they try to intercept incoming weapons and they can also be carried on small craft as well or on a rail. Then we have container launchers. These contain four missiles with one torpedo ready to launch, and they can just fire off a bunch of missiles at once. And then they give some tips on conducting missile combat and the roles of escorts in combat. So a big target will tend to have a, a fleet of close escorts that are small craft, like fighters and patrol craft that can take out incoming missiles and torpedoes, or a dogfight incoming small craft. Very useful to have. And then finally, vector-based space combat. This just looks really cool. I mean, if you've seen The Expanse or anything like that, or Babylon 5, you know how this works. 
works. Um, if you know basic astromechanics, you know how this works. So when you're firing your thrusters to get somewhere, you fire to the halfway point, constantly accelerate to get the highest possible speed. And when you get to the midpoint, you have to flip over and do a deceleration burn the rest of the way so that you get down to the appropriate speed because space is frictionless. Typically in Traveler, we assume that we're using reactionless drives and, and stuff like that. You don't really need to worry about this. It's really cool to have this option in the game. They go through how to use your different types of maps. They can be square grids, they can be hex grids, and how to, to work out your thrust vectors in these different types of grids, which is fantastic. Using the z-axis as well, you can even go three-dimensional, and then how to adapt your map scale to the range bands, basically. So I'm definitely going to need to take a closer look at this, but you know, it's really nice and compact. Everything looks really nicely explained with diagrams. There's even some hexagonal cutouts to use on your hex grids for missile salvos, scout ships, you know, high port stations, asteroids, and gas giants and stuff that you would typically find when you're flying out in space that might be interesting to have during a combat. They also have how to use missiles in vector-based combat, larger scale maps, dogfighting, you know, ships that pass in the night so you fly past each other at high acceleration. Um, how does that work? Then we got a brief page on Starship automation. So, you know, how much automation do you want to have on your ship and what does that affect in terms of your crew requirements they can have gravitic shielding at tech level 16 basically creates a region of twisting gravitational forces by the hull it doesn't affect energy weapons but can rip apart small craft or missile and a taste of tech level 16 which we don't normally see and in fact it advances all the way up to 21 here where it costs 25 million credits it automatically destroys incoming missiles automatically deflects plasma or fusion weapons and does 32 dice of damage to nearby vessels and the g tolerance is possibly infinite. So that's pretty incredible. So a little taste of higher tech levels there where, where tech starts to become magic. Then we got some starship weaponry as well. So this is again for more advanced civilizations. Got tech levels 20, 22, and 24. So we've got antimatter weapons, plasma and fusion carronade weapons, hull cutters and disintegrators, which are just really, really rough. Um, you can see the damage is really extreme for antimatter. You know, 8D times 5 for a large streamer bay. 12, 16D damage for... Plasma infusion carronades, uh, 12D damage for hull cutters. Then for disintegrators, we get into the higher tech levels, and these are destructive weapons. As you can see, they've got plus DD. That means you roll 3D, 4D, or 5D, depending, and then you multiply by 10 to get the damage, which is massive. And note how these are written. You know, you've got a base size, base power, and max size. So the disintegrators can be giant spinal mounts if you want them to be which would make them super duper powerful. Um, they do have the trait of chain reaction, so watch out for that. Uh, there's also general purpose mass drivers. So these are more primitive. We saw them in the expanse as well, just chucking asteroids and stuff. And then we have torpedo interceptor clusters. And then a little, little explanation of those additional weapon traits. So spent a lot of time in this book, but it is really, really cool. Loads of excellent stuff in there for travelers of all stripes and for referees as well. And I think really great if you want to add detail to some interesting parts of your campaign. Now we're going to look at the ships. We have the Adventure Class Ships book. Uh, it's about 160 pages. I'm just going to quickly flip through, not focus too much on the stats here. But there's a lot of great stuff in here. What we will see is a lot of interesting ships that can be used by travelers in different types of campaigns. And they also give you some hot tips here on um, if travelers are lucky enough to roll ships as benefits, then you know if they roll a free trader, you could substitute certain ships from this book instead. So perhaps a jump cutter, a vault in class far trader instead of a free trader. For a lab ship, they could get a medical scout or a jump cutter, uh, which is really great. So it just gives a lot more options for beginning groups. And they subdivide the different types of ships into different categories. So we've got exploration ships. Oh, we've got the stealth scout here, which is fantastic. It's very expensive for a 100 ton ship, but it does have armor, advanced stealth, jump to and stealth jump, plus weapons. So it's going to be pretty much invisible and handy for a first strike if you run into any trouble. Got extended scouts. They have a jump three and can, you know, take you that little bit further. They don't have that much in the way of cargo space, only seven tons. And there's not a lot of creature comforts, but they will get you far. We've got the frontiersmen. So we see these out in the frontiers of chartered space. They've got jump two, but they can jump twice in a row uh, without having to refuel, which is handy. And they're 150 tons, so a little bit bigger, a little bit more cargo space. They're good for charting deep space. You've got the Far Scout, which you will really only see out in the frontier. So they've got Jump 4, Tech Level 14. They're quite chunky at 200 tons, but 94 mega credits. I mean, if you really want, if you had characters who really wanted to explore the far reaches of charted space and have a 
good jump rating on a bigger ship. I think this is within the realm of possibility if you're feeling generous. But the medical scout is uh, also very expensive. We got 164 there, million credits. Tech level 14. So if you want to run a like disaster relief campaign or something cool like that, something unique, this is a, a way to do it. It's got jump three as well, which allows it to reach areas that require assistance more quickly. And it's got loads of room for patients as well as the crew. We've got the Far Reach Survey Scout. So this is a big scout ship, 500 tons, and it's got quite a lot of crew. So you need some NPCs to fill that out. But you can see there's 36 tons of cargo space, which is massive, and a huge lot of docking space in here. So you could actually dock smaller ships in there as well for additional defenses. We've got the classic broadsword exploration cruiser used by mercenary outfits throughout charted space. If you manage to get high enough in your notoriety that you are running your own mercenary outfit, you probably want to invest in one of these, but they do cost 395 million credits, so watch out for that. But they're really tough. They can hold loads of people, and they've got thrust three, jump three. They're energy efficient. They've got double turrets as well, um, times four. So put a lot of weapons on them, and just a huge amount of space, as you can see. Then we've got merchant shipping. So the first one here, this is a really good one for uh, new travelers. It's a free trader modified how most traveler groups would do it anyway. So you don't have to waste time actually doing it. So it's a 200 ton free trader, but it's got armor. It's been streamlined. It's got weapons on it. So two double turrets with beam lasers, the other with missile rocks and sandcasters. And the purchase cost is again, not too big a deal. So very handy. Got the free smuggler. So if you want to do, you know, like the Millennium Falcon and have smugglers compartments and deal in high risk cargo, you have a concealed compartment that can hold 10 tons of stuff and 60 tons of regular cargo space. But again, both this these ships, the Arm Trader and the Free Smuggler only have Jump 1, so bear that in mind. I'm going to need to operate in a relatively small space. The Far Trader, however, has Jump 2 and 50.32 tons of cargo and auto mount. It does have these handy wings, which is nice, because that means you're really, really advantageous for aerospace operations when you want to land somewhere. Then you've got the Shadow Trader, which looks really badass. I love the way that looks. It's streamlined as well and has aero fins, so again, good for landing somewhere. For secret meetings, it's got Armor, Thrust 3, Jump 2, and Stealth Jump, and Improved Stealth as well on the exterior so you might want to use this if you're going to deal with you know smuggling weapons or otherwise uh, illicit materials you can sneak into a system land it somewhere pretty much a lot of places would be none the wiser unless they have really good detection systems got the merchant trader 300 ton vessel with a bigger crew you need a couple of engineers for that this one's got thrust two jump two some docking space four tons and a couple of land craft and aircraft we've got uh, 97 tons of cargo space huge cargo space area here then we've got the Antique Trader, which looks really old school. Tech level 9, thrust 1, jump 1, so it's not very fast. But it does have a heck of a lot of cargo space at 263. And it's very cheap at 58 million credits, considering that it's 400 tons. So, I mean, if you want to haul a lot of cargo, and you're not too worried about speed or the thing sort of falling apart on you, this is a pretty good investment for the price. And then we got the Fast Smuggler. Again, this is a bigger ship, 400 tons. It's streamlined. It's got improved stealth, which is handy. Thrust 5, so very maneuverable in system. And it's got Jump 2 and Stealth Jump. So again, very good for smuggling. And it's got an enormous cargo space of 129. But it's very expensive at 221 million credits. So watch out for that. Got the Extended Merchant, a long skinny thing here. A lot of staterooms there, as you can see. 500 tons, streamlined, but only Jump 1. But it has 229 tons of cargo space, which is pretty excellent. So swings and roundabouts. Depends on what you're trying to focus on with these different ships, of course. Then you've got the Long Trader. Jump 4, this one, but only Thrust 1. It's quite bulky and slow in normal space, and it's got a 500 ton hull, and it's uh, reasonably expensive, 161 million credits, but it does have double turrets, including a sandcaster and a beam laser. 116 tons of cargo space. So with that plus Jump 4, you can do some long distance trade routes and potentially make a lot of money. The Standard Merchant is a bit different. It's 500 tons as well, but it's only got Jump 2, rather less expensive, and and, uh, it has triple turrets, so it's a bit more defensible. You're trading off with this. You lose your stealth, but you gain more defensive weaponry or offensive weaponry, depending on your inclination. Then we got the Armored Merchant. So if you're operating in space where there's piracy and you need to really protect your interest and you've got the money for it, which would happen to be 394 million credits, then you can get yourself one of these. It's a thousand tons. It's got armor thrust one jump of four you've got military grade sensors double turrets with beam lasers times four and then you've got six triple turrets of missile racks so a huge amount of weaponry should easily deter your typical corsair because they would take a lot more damage than it'd be worth and you've got 182 tons of cargo space so pretty dang good but very expensive got the armored packet a thousand tons so this is more for planetary governments and some you know if you're working for a highly specialized company they got jump of two 286 tons of cargo space 
fuel processors, all the usual kind of stuff. Uh, but they do also have four triple turrets, four double turrets, and two small fusion bays as well. So you've got a higher class weaponry on this guy. And a lot of deck plans, because it's a big ship. We've got the Provincial Merchant. This is, again, another 1,000-ton ship. Probably beyond the reach of most player characters until they get really powerful. But it's not that expensive for the size of 1,000 tons, but it's only jump one. But you do have 758 tons of cargo space. So if you're able to come up with the money and you want to do a merchant ba trading base campaign, maybe it's worth the investment. A provincial transport as well, you got 271 tons of cargo space. A lot of layers here, including a lower middle deck and a lower deck for all that cargo. It's also got some 20 high grade berths and a swimming pool. So you could use this for more luxurious travel if you like. It's got jump two, which is not too bad. Got a merchant vessel from the triads here, 1,000 tons, jump of two, tech level 15, so it's got a good computer, two double turrets, two triple turrets, and 595 tons of cargo space, so a lot of this thing is just emptiness. And the crew areas are all in the towers up here on the top, the rest is just open cargo space basically. Got a large freighter, which is a close structure, so it's kind of two sections connected by a superstructure. It's got a jump of three, which is pretty awesome, and it's got one double turret for sandcasters, one double turret beam lasers, but not much else. So it feels a little bit vulnerable to me when you've got that sort of worrisome connection between chunks, but it carries a heck of a lot of cargo, 819 tons, but it does cost over half a billion credits for this 2,000 ton structure. Then we get into passenger shipping. So here we got liners and shuttles and stuff. Got a fast luxury transport, thrust of six, which is awesome. Jump of four, also awesome. And only for 78 million credits, but it is quite small. So you've got your pilot compartment, you've got a head, a couple of staterooms, a luxury stateroom and a common area. So basically this is for people of means who want to get somewhere quickly. So it's uh, something you'd see nobles flying around in with a strong thrust and, and high jump rating. We've got large liners, so these are jump two, and these are relatively less glamorous ways for the typical civilians to travel down the main trade routes to get from system to system. We've got 70 standard staterooms and 140 low berths. So low berths are where you're frozen, uh, which has a chance of killing you. So not always the best thing to do. Then we've got the long liner, 800 tons in the streamlined with jump four. It's pretty cool. This one has 24 high standard staterooms and seven standard ones and an advanced theater as well as a common area. This will be good for luxury passengers basically. We've got the merchant liner as well, not an uncommon sight. So they blend cargo hauling with passenger hauling. So again, you're looking at standard and low berths. This is not a luxurious travel, but you do have an awful lot of cargo space and a lot of berths as well. 80 standard berths, 50 low berths, 1,000 tons, but it costs 281 million credits. So, you know, again, uh, but you can carry 179 tons of cargo at the same time. Then we've got the passenger cruiser, which is pretty cool looking actually. So this is the workhorse of the space lanes, it says. A 1,200 tons, jump three, tech level 12. It's got six luxury staterooms, 10 high staterooms, 70 standard, and 100 low berths. So you got a mixture of catering to almost everybody. You've got an advanced theater and two hot tubs. It's pretty nice. And you can see it's got an interesting arrangement here. So here in six, we've got all, all of our low berths crammed together, and then we've got loads of different staterooms on the other levels. And we've got our Starfaring Hotel. Look at this guy. Pretty interesting design here. So this one is more for, you know, it's kind of like an interstellar cruise. You go on this to look at amazing sights and nebulae and pulsars and all that kind of stuff. And it's the province of the wealthier traveler. So got luxury staterooms with wet bar and entertainment times 10. High staterooms with wet bar and entertainment times 12. And 40 standard staterooms. 1,400 tons, jump of three, and a cost of more than half a billion credits. Very expensive, but if you've got the cash flow or can obtain it somehow, you could make a lot of money ferrying tourists around. And you can see it's a massive ship, it just keeps on going. Then we have a luxury Starliner. So this one doesn't even pretend to court the credits of ordinary civilians. 2,000 tons, jump two, but it has several subsidiary craft. It's got a full hangar, modular cutter, two pinnaces, and some docking spaces. It's got luxury staterooms times 26, high times 15, and standard times 16, gourmet kitchen, a theater, a swimming pool, two hot tubs, and a zero-g entertainment room. You can see a leisure deck here that has all that stuff. Looks pretty luxurious and streamlined, very cool. Then we've got, you know, the theaters, we've got kitchens for the gourmets, then we've got all of our mechanics buried down below here, the jump drives and maneuvering thrusters, and then some cargo space as well. 
Now we've got our working ships. So the express packet. This is a small and fast vessel for when you need to get data and physical items out, basically pretty quickly, but you don't want to use a standard courier ship along the typical X-boat networks. So you'd send out one of these boys with jump four and thrust four, and they can speed along and hopefully get the information and small items you need to somewhere quickly. They only carry 10 tons of cargo. They're only 100 tons, but they are cheap. So, you know, if you want to be a the kind of interstellar equivalent of a bike messenger, <laughs> I think this is probably where you want to go. Alternatively, you have jump cutters. So this is a modular cutter times two. So this can use four standard modules. So you can customize your ship by using different modules. You can change your configuration, but it's also jump capable. Not very jump capable. It's only jump one, but it is jump capable. The base space frame costs you 48 million, but remember you'll have to buy the modules modules as well. So, and we have a long range courier. Again, if you need to get something somewhere quickly and you need information to get somewhere as fast as you possibly can, but not along the standard networks, this long range courier is for you. It's 200 tons, got reinforced advanced stealth, thrust four, jump five, and early jump. So it can get into jump really quickly. High evasion software as well. So it's designed to be stealthy and quick and get in and out of a system and move on very quickly. Purchase price is high though at 336 million. Then we've got the hospice boat. So here we have a 300 ton hull with jump of two and 12 standard berths, 20 low berths. So this is for transporting the sick and the injured to medical facilities. So not very luxurious, but very much necessary. That's why it's in the working ship section. Similarly, we have the prison ferry. You need to bring prisoners to somewhere uh, where they need to be incarcerated. You cram them in here. So you've got six standard state rooms, which basically for the crew and everybody else is in the low berths. So the life of a prisoner is rough. You might not wake up when they put you in the low births, but you shouldn't have committed the crime, I guess. That's their attitude. We got the prospectors. So these are for belters, essentially 400 tons, jump of two, and they've got some single turrets and double turrets, and they've got fuel processors and mining drones, and they're designed to go out and mine valuable stuff out of the belt, store it in their massive 198 tons of cargo space, and they're relatively cheap at just over 100 million credits, considering the amount of, the size and the amount of carriage that they have. Then we've got customs patrol cutters. These are the guys you don't want to run into if you're smuggling. They're 600 tons, streamlined. They've got armor, thrust of six, so they can run down pretty much anyone except for fighters. They don't have a jump facility. These are just, you know, customs patrol within a system, basically. They've got medium fusion bay, three triple turrets with beam lasers, and two missile racks. So they can shoot you with missiles, fusion beams, and chase you down. So you got to be on your toes. Got repair ships as well. So they're dispatched to rec rescue ships that have sort of run adrift or or something else has gone wrong and they've got grappling cables and stuff and tow cables to deal with that and they're jump three which is nice and they can sort of grapple you get you out of dodge to a reasonable distance they need a lot of engineers though five and four maintenance specialists as well and they cost quite a bit 241 million but you will find these in a lot of star systems to help people same with the salvage hauler so it, it's kind of the opposite in a way because you don't want to recover the ships you want to take it <laughs> and strip it of anything useful that it has so if you want to be the drukmani scavengers in um, lower decks or something like that this is the kind of ship that would be for you again it's uh, 1200 tons so it's quite expensive 372 million credits got a jump of two but it's got big old cargo scoops cargo cranes tow cables grappling arms and docking clamps so basically you can grab onto a ship that is run into trouble and steal it and jump away and we got their military section here so we've got strike scouts this is a modification of the traditional scout ship that's basically made for pirates take a, a type s scout ship the standard at 100 tons give it streamlined and improved stealth some armor thrust two and jump two which is uh, one better than normal plus stealth jump you've got military grade sensors triple pop-up turrets with lasers and yeah I mean, kind of looks like a scout ship, but most people will quickly be able to tell that you probably are up to no good with one of these. Got light recon ships, which are really cool looking. They look kind of like something out of Traveler 2300 AD with this sort of rotating section. But these are all about jumping into a system with their jump four. They've got high thrust as well, and they're streamlined. They're quite expensive, but they've got really high quality systems like uh, advanced pro drones. They've got advanced sensors, including sensor stations, countermeasures suite, shallow penetration suite, enhanced signal processing. Processing. Plus, they've got some defense in the form of pulse lasers and sand 
Lancasters. So they're designed to jump ahead, look into what's going on in the territory where you might expect hostile forces, and then come back and let you know what you're facing in that region. We have something cool here, the pirate carrier, really like these guys, so it's just what it sounds like. It's a 300 ton carrier that is used by pirates, so it's got thrust three, but four if the fighters are deployed, and jump of two, and then it has 10 light fighters, which are quite dangerous in themselves. Then we've got assault gunships, so these are often found in the fleets of planetary governments, so they have a low jump rating but high thrust at six, so, and quite a few weapons, uh, small fusion gun bays, triple turrets and double turrets, and sandcasters as well. So these are what you want to defend your planetary integrity within a system. We got a Valor Missile Corvette. So these are for small empires and planetary governments. Thrust six and jump of four. Ten armor. Hull displacement, 400 tons. 278 million credits. Great sensors. They've got four missile racks. So they are focused on missile-based combat. And some of them will tend to be nuclear, but you're not really supposed to carry those. But don't tell anyone. Ambush frigates. So these are designed to jump into a system and sort of hang about until you locate a valuable target. So they've got stealth and stealth jump as well and they are built to hide in waiting see if you can grab your target as soon as they jump into a system and if you slip away they have a high thrust so they can hunt you pretty well We've got commerce raiders so this is the standard kind of one ship pirate band ship half a billion credits so big investment 800 tons we've got thrust of six jump of three with decreased fuel consumption it's got fusion gun bays particle barbettes and triple turrets so it's pretty heavy on the armament designed to be able to thrust at high speed ambush you with its powerful weapons and flood you with pirates and corsairs who either cut you to ribbons or just take all your stuff or both. Then we've got mercenary carriers as well. These are 800 tons. They carry 20 barracks and nine standard staterooms. So these are for carrying your mercenary contingent, you know, to a battle zone essentially. And then we've got the Travelers Be Like section. So these are designed and built for travelers. You've got the executive yacht, 100 tons with a high thrust, of six, jump of two. Don't have much room for storing people, I guess, but better than a typical yacht. And uh, they've got a hot tub and a wet bar. So if you want to travel in luxury, that's the way to go. And they're not too expensive, but they are... Not too big, they just have one triple turret, so not all that in combat. The Huntress Warrant ship is good if you want to be a bounty hunter, and there, by the way, is a supplement coming out on that from Mongoose later this year, so keep an eye out for that. This one has Thrust 4, Jump 3, Double Turrets, and it's got decent ability to chase people down. Um... Then we've got the custom safari ship. So this is how the truly wealthy go hunting on alien worlds many parsecs away. So you use jump, your jump three to get out there into the wilds. You've got loads of systems, including multi-environment spaces, which I guess you could use for training for whatever wild environment you're gonna be in. You've got a swimming pool and other luxuries, as well as standard staterooms. We've got the private yacht. So this is a 400 ton yacht, so 196 million credits. It's got aero fins for atmospheric travel and it's streamlined. It's got jump four with decreased fuel times two, which is great. It's got some docking space, a ship's boat, and an air raft, which is always handy. And you've got five luxury staterooms with entertainment system and wet bar and three standard staterooms, so pretty fancy. Uh, it's also got a theater as well. So again, traveling in style, but no weaponry. So watch out for that. Then we have the blockade runners. So this is when you want to get a bunch of cargo through hostile space. You've got 65 tons of cargo space. You've got radiation shielding to help you run through even military cordons where they might have mess on beams and stuff like that. 205 million credits, thrust of six and thrust of four with a reaction drive. Then it's got jump two and early jumps. So you you can jump out of dodge pretty quickly if you need to. So yeah, if you want to run that blockade, this is the way to do it. We've got a touring ship. It's like an intergalactic tour bus, essentially. So if you want to bring your entertainment to the galaxy at large, then you would have this. It's a touring ship. So you can see it says main stage down here. Drop yourself down onto any world and provide entertainment for the locals. Pretty fun. We've got the pleasure ship, Lady Luck. So it's a 900 ton ship at 322 million credits. We've got loads of staterooms here. One luxury, 12 high and 33 standard. You've got wet bars, swimming pools, theaters. People like to come up here and do some do some old gambling, basically. Play some games of chance. And as you know, the house always wins. So take advantage of that. We've got the Starborn Wanderer Traveling Cruiser. This is a 1,000 ton streamlined stealth and radiation shielded monstrosity. 781 million credits. So this is for the truly rich traveling group. Thrust 3, Jump 3, and all the fixings. you got fusion gun bays, repulsor bays. you got a library, medical bay. you got six luxury state rooms rooms too standard you got loads of software on your fancy computer you got a swimming pool and 37 tons of cargo space pretty much got it all then we got some aslan ships the uh, Steau Combat Scout. 
So 200 tons, thrust 5, jump 2, and they've got triple turret missile racks, triple turret pulse lasers. The Aslans are keen on combat, so generally expect their ships to be uh, well armed. They've got a hunting ship here, 87 million credits, thrust 3, jump 2. It's only got single turrets though, so it's more of a safari ship rather than hunting other spaceships kind of ship. And you can see it's got a characteristic Aslan shape. They like s sort of circular things, it seems like. They've got a raider ship, so they're intended to work alone, and they're they're quite powerful, 800 tons, 9 armor, 3 thrust, energy efficient, and 3 jump. They've got 4 triple turret with lasers, 2 triple turret sandcasters, 2 triple turret missile racks. They can hold troops, they can hold 6 light fighters, but I mean, by themselves they can take on serious opposition. So, um, And we got some ships from the Sword Worlds. The personal yacht, 100 tons, streamlined with arrow fins, jump 2, thrust 2. We got a luxury stateroom, a high stateroom, 2 standards. So yeah, personal yacht, 35 million, not too bad. But again, you know, you're not going to be dealing with weaponry on a ship like this. So you'd have to customize it somehow or rebuild it. The Sleep Near Patroller. It's an older vessel at tech level 11. So it's only got jump 2. But it's got military grade sensors and a penetration suite. Breaching tubes. It's got sandcasters and fixed mount missile racks. And double turrets for the sandcasters. It's also got 10 state rooms and 10 barracks. So you get some troops on there. Uh, we've got the Bombardier. So it's relatively rare. So this is a ship that's designed to bombard from afar while it's being screened by the rest the fleet so it's got particle beam bays torpedo barbette times two and two triple turrets of missile racks so you've got a load of torpedoes in storage and a load of missiles and you chuck those at your enemies from distance and uh, see what they can do about it then we got some shit for the Varger, our dog friends, the Stealth Runner, 100 tons, streamlined, enhanced stealth and arrow fins, thrust of 6, stealth jump. So it's a very sneaky ship in general, but just a double turret of beam lasers for weaponry, so it relies on lack of detection. Once it's detected, you want to run away with your high thrust and stealth jump. So very typical of the Varger who are keen on their staying close with their packs and working in small groups. We've also got a fast trader, thrust 6, jump 2. This eschews the stealth features and instead has two triple turrets with pulse lasers and sandcasters. So this is more of a standard far trader kind of equivalent for the Varger. Got the armed junker with lurid colors because dog vision is weird and they like see mostly in blues and yellows. Thrust 2 jump 1, 97 million credits. Carries a lot of cargo at 242 tons and it's got some smuggling compartments as well for 20 more tons. Um, it's also got some tow cable and grapple arms if you want to do some salvage, which is cool. You've got the Reaver. Look at this guy. It looks pretty badass in blue and orange, I gotta say. 500 tons, but it costs 232 million credits and it has has armor of 8, thrust 4, jump 2, high grade computer, military grade sensors, small missile bays, triple turret particle beams, times 2, triple turret beam lasers, times 2, 288 missiles, gravitic speeders, and 24 barracks, so quite heavily armed. And that is it, that's the Adventure Class ships. So with the remainder of my time here, we'll just quickly go through the Small Craft Catalog, which is a short book, sorry, sorry for the reflection tier, we'll surely be past that. But yeah, this book is great because it just helps to populate the systems that you travel through with additional flavor. First off, it has some revised operation time so that if you want to set more of your crew time or spend more of your cruise time on a light craft, the endurance and cargo they can carry makes more sense. You can kind of choose which of these options you want for the different types of ships. Then we have a huge array of different modules, which we saw you can use for your modular cutters and the jump cutter as well. You could have four of them. And there's all different kinds. They go on and on. We got missile support, orbital outposts, passengers, planetary assault, missile storage, low berths, public house. You can run a pub with microbrew, relaxation module, spaceborne early warning, urban module, salvage. Then we get into our commercial craft. So a civilian hopper is like something that a small family business might own. It costs less than a million credits. It's only got one thrust, runs on fission, not fusion. So it's very basic, but it's enough to get around the system and, and make a few bucks. You've got advertising boats, which are thrust one, do have fusion power plants, but are otherwise quite basic. Just space-borne billboards, essentially. We've got the cargo shuttles, which are designed to lift small amounts of cargo up into orbit or to nearby planets in the system. So they're typically in use in more developed star systems at tech level 12, but they've only got thrust too, so they're not super fast, but they've got a decent amount of cargo space at 22 tons, given they're only 40 tons overall. Got the smuggler's pinnace, so 40 tons again, but it's got a concealed compartment for two tons of contraband, if you would like. Got a high burn thruster at thrust 5 or a thrust 5 M drive, so they're very speedy, but of course they look suspicious to any customs official worth their salt. We've got the short shuttle, so this is economic flight from surface to orbit, or at most from planet to moon. So you can see it's just packed with seats, no staterooms, nothing like that. This is just, you know, 
spend the few minutes it takes to get up into orbit or a few hours it takes to get to the moon and come straight back, load up on passengers and do it again. We've got the fast shuttle. So this is for passenger transport within system. It's got thrust of three. It's got six standard staterooms and then 22 bits of cabin space, which we see here. So this is for moving between planets within a system. Likewise, we've got the trade shuttle, which is a similar idea, but for goods rather than passengers. You can still carry some passengers as well in the cabin space areas, but it also has 26 tons of cargo space in the 90 ton hull. And it's not too expensive at 22 million credits. Then we have the extended range passenger shuttle, which only has a thrust of two, but it can operate for a longer period of time. It has 40 cabin spaces, so it's very much dedicated to uh, passenger travel, but it can still carry nine tons of cargo as well. Extended fuel tanks give it an extended range in system. They've got working craft, so this is really basic stuff that other craft often need, like automated lifeboats. You need to escape from, you know, a stricken ship to the nearest space station. We've got freight handler pods if you need to move things and cargo between one ship and another. We've got transporters, so these you see all around spaceports and high ports especially. They just have some docking clamps to move stuff around between ships and moons or from a planetary surface to a high port. Got utility pods, which are again, extremely common. They're for small cargo delivery or for routine maintenance, moving containers around. The tradesman's gig. So this is a single owner operator ship. There's one seat here and a bed. So basically you can travel between the world of a system and uh, do a bit of trading. And it's only 15 tons, but uh, it's got thrust of two, which is not too bad. And it can run for eight weeks. So pretty decent overall for a one man ship. And uh, yeah, if you want to do a solo game of Expanse tradesmanship, you can do that. Then we got belter launches basically a, a small ship's boat modified for belter usage and we have a customs launch so this is a way to conduct in-system inspections in an inexpensive way it's very cheap at 10 million credits it's got thrust of three so it's much faster than the belter launch for example at thrust of one so it's not as good as a specialized custom ship but it'll get the job done the lifeboats so very common auxiliary small craft so there's a, a time limit on how long you can survive on these things 32 weeks of operation in the fuel tanks but you know they've got a bunch of acceleration seats and low berths to get people out of dodge if your ship goes askew. Likewise, we've got a medical launch, which can be a lifesaver. You can put people into hibernation, and then you've got a huge area of medical bays. So if somebody needs urgent treatment and needs to be taken out of space and into a medical facility, you can keep them alive on this thing. We've got rescue boats, so they respond to space-based emergencies. A high thrust craft at six, which is designed to reach an area of disaster quickly. It's only 30 tons and moves very quickly to an area where a problem has occurred. Got a modular skiff here, so this is very versatile, and it's kind of born from the idea of the modular cutter, but basically it's not very comfortable to live in. You've got just a tiny amount of space here, and most of the space of the craft is taken up by the module. It's only got thrust of two, so you've got to put up with pretty uncomfortable conditions for your longer journeys. Research Finishes, however, they're very fast, five thrust. They will be attached to, you know, well-funded research laboratories and do in-system work with their probe drones and intellect software as well. So these are designed to be research vessels that can get around to interesting phenomenon quickly. Got a small customs patrol boat. This is for physical inspection of ship cargo before they reach a starport. So if they're really suspicious of you, they might flag you down and send in this smaller ship to actually get on board, dock with you, and check your cargo physically. So be careful of that. Got the fast cutter. So this has got thrust of six. It's got great performance for the size. It's able to hold a standard 30 ton module, but it's got more crew space, more comfortable than the poor man's cutter that we saw before. And it moves much, much faster, but it has a, a lower period of operation. That's the trade-off. It's only 15 mega credits, so not too bad. But the ship to ship shuttle, which is basically used in orbital space to move large amounts of cargo between one ship and another. We've got traffic control routers, so this is packed full of sensors and analysis suites and good computers. They sit in high orbit, monitoring and directing space traffic, and there will be some manned stations in here. People staying in there. Thrust is only one, so it can't, they don't move around that much. Not supposed to, but, you know, they're kind of the air traffic control of orbital space. We've got our heavy modular cutter. So this is less common than the regular modular cutter, but it holds an extra module, which is very handy. It's got a thrust of four, so pretty good performance. And uh, cabin space, so it's, again, it's not very comfortable, but... But, you know, you're not supposed to live in it for months at a time like you would a free trader or something. Then we got my favorite section, which is the fighters. We've got old school ones at tech level seven. Uh, the Home Shield Mini Fighter, only five tons. Thrust of three and a fixed mount missile rack. That's it. But, you know, missiles can still do some damage. We've got the ground attack fighter with fixed mount autocannons and anti-tank missiles. So they're good for aerospace work, basically. 
Then we've got the Moray Antique Fighter at tech level 8, thrust of 6, so, so quite fast. Um, they got a fixed mount missile rack as well. Very affordable for lesser planetary governments. The Sentinel Escort Fighter is not really designed to take on, you know, small craft as such, although it can do. It's got a thrust of 3 only, but it's got armor and it's got beam lasers. And it's basically designed to protect unarmed ships from missile attacks. So it, it hangs around the ship that it needs to protect and shoots down incoming salvos as much as it can. We've got the old Junker product of a desperate scrap yard, but it does have some missiles and a turret missile rack. We've got the Kashu multi-role fighter, much more expensive at 51 mega credits, 20 tons, streamlined, reinforced aero fins, and radiation shielding, which is pretty cool. Thrust of nine, so it's crazy fast. And it's got a pulse laser, fixed mount, and a fixed mount PG HP 14 times two, pretty heavily armed. And we can see he's got those multiple fixed mounts there on the diagram. Got the covert ops fighter. So this one is 41 mega credits, Thrust of six, more focused on stealth than combat. Got the Assault Fighter. This one is all about having missiles, basically. It's got a firm point missile rack, loads and loads of missile storage, and just a single pulse laser otherwise, so it's designed to just launch, launch, and launch, and launch. Military, we've got some space surveillance boats. These are stealth-based, and they have no weapons as such. They're just keeping an eye on things, and they've got good sensors and improved signal processing. We've got carrier support craft, so these are really specialized. They're launched alongside fighters, and they recover disabled fighters and any ejected crew via the airlock. So they are to support fighter wings once they've been launched. Then we've got the fast launch, a 20-ton craft operating in a military environment, so it's got a little bit of armor, high thrust of four, and a fixed mount beam laser for basic defense. The fighting launch goes a bit further. It's got a thrust of five and a fixed mount pulse laser. The covert insertion boat is basically like a pinnace, but it has enhanced stealth, very efficient high thrust of five, and it's got really good sensors and a countermeasure suite as well. So if somebody's trying to look for you, you can scramble their signals. We got the SO boat, a spaceborne electronic warfare boat. So this is all about scrambling opposition sensors. It's got improved sensor stations and military countermeasures, which is very good. And it's got sandcasters to defend itself from attack and radiation shielding plus stealth. But you know, the only weapon it has is a sandcaster, which is defensive only. Compare contrast that with the strike boat which is blisteringly fast, it says, it thrust 9. This one has a fixed mount missile rack and 132 missiles in storage. It's fast, maneuverable, but also quite expensive at 51 mega credits. System Defense Rock is quite funny, so it camouflages itself as an asteroid, a small rock, but yeah, it's, that gives it some armor. It's still got thrust of 2. It can launch a whole bunch of missiles out of this rock, which is pretty cool, and has a pulse laser as well. And we've got a boarding shuttle, which is used to launch from warships to directly deliver a boarding party to a vessel that's been neutralized. Um, they got radiation shielding to protect the soldiers, 15 armor, 9 thrust, which is crazy, uh, military-grade sensors, uh, pulse lasers, sandcaster, an airlock, and a breaching tube for boarding. Everything you want, basically, to force your way on board an enemy vessel, um, but 44 mega credits for your trouble. You can see it can fit a load of people on there uh, to invade the other ship. Uh, we've got cargo transports, of course. So these are 70 tons. They do have good sensors, military grade, pulse lasers, and two sandcasters. So they do have some defense, but they're mainly about moving cargo around for the military. And we've got the Planetary Assault Barge. So it's fairly spherical, a bit bigger at 90 tons, thrust of four, super dense armor. It's got a pulse laser, and basically it's designed to drop well-armored Marines down onto the planetary surface and engage in combat. So you can see that here. Got system defense craft with reinforced radiation shielding, lots of armor, thrust of six, and a fusion gun, single turret, and two missile racks. So they're a pretty good solution, but uh, pretty expensive for a 95 ton ship with no jump capability, but it will defend your system nice and well. And you can see a ton of missile storage here. Then we got our luxury craft. So the runabout, just a 15 ton thrust six, fast little speedy guy. Civilian grade sensors, no weapons. Just a quick way to maneuver about the system and just under 10 million credits, so not out of the reach of travelers who've been around for a while. Protective shuttles, so these guys are protecting VIPs as they travel in system. They've got thrust of six, 11 armor, radiation shielding, uh, reinforced radiation shielding, in fact, and they've got fixed mount sandcasters and beam lasers for defense, plus re-entry capsules, medical bays. So if you really need to protect somebody as they come in system, you would put them on board this guy. We also got the pressurized yacht, which is awesome. It looks like an airborne manta ray. So this can fly in space, and it can also fly in highly pressurized environments, such as underwater. So you can go into the atmospheres of gas giants and the depths of planetary oceans. How cool is that? And it's got a gourmet kitchen. 
just for added fanciness. We've got an in-system sailing yacht, which uses a solar sail, uh, which have a thrust of zero effectively, which is kind of funny. But it's kind of a old school and glamorous looking way to travel. It's more of a toy than something real. So you can only buy this if you're a noble with too much time in your hands. But the, the shape of it does look really cool. And we've got a luxury shuttle, which is a really nice looking craft. Thrust of four as well, so quite speedy. It does have fuel scoops and a gourmet kitchen. It's got a pilot and a steward to look after. Um, high-end visitors. Ooh, seems in shipment. Something weird happened to this page. Um, then we got some Aslan craft. They've got a light fighter at 8 tons, tech level 11, with a fixed mount missile rack. Again, you know the diagrams for these make me laugh because they're so simple. Just a cockpit and engines, basically. The Quill Rock light fighter is 10 tons, thrust of 7, so it's a bit faster. It's got a fixed mount pulse laser instead of missiles, so it's designed to be quick and particularly chase after other small craft and missiles. Then we got the reconnaissance pinnace here, so it's got beam lasers and it's streamlined, got a high thrust, so it was designed to get out there and uh, look out for targets. We've got the Shrine Ship, so this is designed for uh, a clan when they want to visit somewhere Aslan and consider the actions of their ancestors, and there's a shrine of heroes on the ship, so it's kind of a peek into an interesting aspect of Aslan culture and what happens in Aslan space. And we've got the assault craft, 90 tons, streamlined, thrust of four, pretty decent, military-grade sensors, a bunch of weapons, beam lasers, rotary auto cannons, and medium Gauss cannon, so they're de designed to deliver 128 fearsome Aslan warriors into the heart of battle. You can see all this, their seats here, so it's a planetary assault delivery system. Then in the sword world, we've got their variation on the ship's boat. Uh, tech level 12, thrust 6, very fast, and does have a fixed mount missile rack as well, but even at only 30 tons, so it's pretty cool. And they've got the Boulder Attack Fighter, so 40 tons, got a little bit of armor, but very high thrust at 9, but that only lasts for one and a half hours. Thrust 9, because it's a reaction drive. It doesn't have a, a reactionless drive. The Vanguard Fusion Boat, however, does. It has an M drive at thrust 6, and yeah, this is mounted with a Fusion Barbette quite a powerful weapon. Uh, I need to get in more close to use that effectively, but it does have military-grade sensors and reinforced arrow fins allow it to work in atmosphere as well. The Vanguard M is a variation of that, which is a missile boat, so instead of a fusion barbette, it has a missile barbette and stores 150 missiles as well. Both are relatively cheap for a, a military delivery craft, you know, about 35 to 37 uh, million credits. The Varger, we've got a belt racer with thrust 16, but they only operate for 52 minutes, so it's incredibly dangerous and fast. But it's very fun to watch the, these races in the Varger bars. Got the Gotha Ambush Fighter. So they got a pressure hull. So they're, they're designed to hang about in the atmospheres of gas giants and then surprise you. Whoops, while you're refueling. They've got a fixed mount pulse laser and military grade sensors to help them with that. As well as the pressurized hull. Pressure hull, rather. Then we've got the Noel Garai Strike Fighter. Streamlined. Thrust of six. And a high burn R drive. Uh, military grade sensors and fixed mount beam laser. Then we got a Corsair pinnace with thrust of five, a bit of armor, military grade sensors and a beam laser. It looks pretty hardy as well. Again, not very glamorous to live in, but we're dealing with within system piracy, so. And now finally we have some Jodani small craft, which is very cool. I'm really waiting for more supplements on the Jodani consulate in the traveler setting, so I hope this is a good sign of things to come. Eight tons, thrust of six, a fixed mount beam laser, so could carry some uh, scary psionics at high speed towards you. Got an intrusion shuttle as well. This is their stealth shuttle. It's got streamlined and advanced stealth, thrust of six, and evasion software as well. More expensive at 49 million credits. And we got the Kia Heavy Fighter. You can see loads of missile storage space for under 20 missiles and it's got a fixed mount fusion gun as well and thrust eight so pretty speedy and a lot of armory to deal with as well so look out for that then we got the Breckeschnacht Belt Survey Vessel. It goes to each planetary body and assesses their value. Got a thrust of three. It's got some really good sensors and mineral detection suites. All kinds of drones, mining drones, probe drones, prospecting buggies, etc. To assess whether a planet has anything worth strip mining out of it. Similarly, there's the Gas Giant Survey Vessel, which does a similar thing. It's got a pressure hull and is really good at surviving harsh environments. And it looks pretty cool as well. That kind of organic, more rounded shape you see with Jodani Craft here. The Drabber Trutor Terrestrial Survey Vessel. So this is 80 tons. Again, it's got tons of detection sensors, including minerals, uh, detection and life scanners. Uh, it's got probe drones, medical bays, and this is designed to go onto the surface with its streamlining. It's got radiation shielding as well, and it's got docking space and an ATV to run about on the surface. 
And there you go. That is the last of our small craft in the small craft catalog. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I hope you got something out of that. There's a lot of good traveler stuff that came out this month. It's been a really enjoyable March 2024 for traveler fans like myself. Um, I hope this helped you decide whether this month's releases were for you. Look forward to some more traveler stuff in the future. And again, do check out Seth Skorkowski's video on traveler, the system and how to play it, which I will link in the description below. In the meantime, please hit like and subscribe on the way out if you can. It just helps keep you motivated. Thank you for joining me and I hope to see you in the comments below and in the next video. All right, take care and bye-bye.